a woman invited some people over for dinner. And at the table, she turned to her six-year-old daughter and said, Would you like to say the blessing? The girl replied, I wouldn't know what to say. Just say what you heard mommy say. The mother answered. The daughter bowed her head and said, Lord, why on earth did we invite these people to dinner? <laughs> Another mother was teaching her three-year-old the Lord's Prayer, and for several evenings at bedtime, she repeated it after her mother. One night, she said she was ready to do it solo. The mother listened and with pride as she carefully enunciated each word. Right up to the end of the prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us some email. Amen. <laughs> then there was the four-year-old that said, and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. <laughs> My name is Byron Kimmel. I'm a member of this church. I'm a teacher. I'm currently enrolled in seminary, about halfway done through that, and, and Maybe someday I'll, I'll be involved in, in ministry, uh, but it's my privilege to deliver the second installment of Lord, Teach Us to Pray, and today we're going to focus on the model kingdom father. <clears throat> Tim Berners-Lee was an Oxford graduate, one of the brightest in the field of physics. Lee was frustrated with the lack of productivity in his area of expertise. Trying to communicate with other entities within this field, bogged down by communication trouble. He sought to develop a new language called hypertext markup language. We know it as HTML. It was Berners Lee hoped that this new technology, this language, could increase productivity and the ability to connect with people all across the world. And Berners Lee is widely regarded as the father of the internet. In the Gospel of Matthew, we find Jesus introducing His disciples to a new language, the language of prayer. We find this in the Gospel of Matthew where the disciples are nestled on the slopes surrounding the Sea of Galilee. There's a picture of the Sea of Galilee on the Mount of Beatitudes. I had the opportunity to go there. So if you could just imagine Jesus there and His disciples huddled around Him. In the middle of His teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus shifts into the focal point of Christianity since its birth that being the Lord's Prayer, and He simply says, this is how you pray. Pious Jews, typically at that time in first century Judea, prayed three times a day. I had the opportunity to see Orthodox Jews in their prayer sessions when I visited the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall in Jerusalem. I saw many Orthodox Jews wearing prayer shawls, the, phylactery, the phylacteries, that's a mouthful, the little boxes on their forehead with the miniature scrolls of the Torah, bobbing their heads up and down and chanting. It was quite a spectacle. Here I am in my basketball shorts and t-shirts <laughs> watching them pray. Muslims pray five times a day facing Mecca. They will get their prayer mats out. They even go through a washing ritual called wudu where they wash their faces, ears, mouth, and prepare 
for prayer. Buddhists spend hours in spiritual meditation. But here our Lord says, this is how you pray. Imagine the disciples at this time and Okay, how do we pray? I'm sure that they were involved in the rituals of being a Jew in first century Judea and Galilee. I'm sure they'd seen the Pharisees and their grandiose prayers. But now Jesus says, this is how you pray. Pastor Dan mentioned last week about how prayer for us changes as we enter into adulthood. The disciples' prayer is going to change as they enter into the kingdom of God. These disciples didn't know it, but they were about to experience a seismic shift in the nature of prayer with the first two words of the Lord's Prayer. You turn your Bibles, if you have them with you, if you have it electronically, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. You find this teaching right in the middle on the Sermon on the Mount. Pick it up in verse 9. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven heaven, hallowed be your name. The first two words, if you break them down, the Greek word for our is ego. You hear that word about someone's got an inflated ego. But ego is the very essence of you. The very inner sanctum, your soul, who comprises you, everything about you. And the word used in the Greek transitioned to an Aramaic word, Abba. Ego, Abba. Our Father. Now the Jews had numerous names for God. Hashem, which means the name. Elohim was more for the Creator. Adonai was kind of a normalized name for God. And Yahweh, the very essence of the Creator, the holy name of God. Here, Jesus says, Abba. Abba. Now, Abba doesn't necessarily necessarily mean daddy. I've heard some people say that it's equivalent as daddy. It did have a reverence to it. But it's kind of on that level of relational. So here Jesus is, is changing what I would say is the proximity of God. <clears throat> you see, the Jews, they like to put, put the, the Yahweh... Adonai, Hashem, Elohim, Adonai. They want to put Him out there at a distance. Here, Jesus brings the proximity of God to right in front of their very faces. Abba, our Father. Jesus was not inventing anything new in the Lord's prayers. Pastor Dan will kind of go through the rest of it with you. He gathered things from everyday Jewish prayer vigils like the 18 benedictions. There was another Aramaic funeral liturgy that he drew from. He he kind of took elements that they were already familiar with, but then he wrapped them up in our Father. He simply released a new programming language like Berners-Lee did. 
You now have this hyperlink connection to God. He's no longer out there in cyberspace. He's right here. This change in proximity creates an adoption for those who seek Him. An adoption into the kingdom of God. You go to Romans with me, chapter 8. Paul writes to the church in Rome. Verse 15. The text says, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. So that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. So, What is this adoption that Paul's talking about? For us, adoption, nearly everyone in here has been affected either directly or indirectly by adoption. Some of you may be from an adopted family. But what Paul's saying here is another layer to it. I came across the story of Sid Roth. Sid Roth was born into an Orthodox Jew, Jewish family. And Roth shares his testimony on a powerful website called One for Israel. On this website, former Jews become Messianic Jews and explain their experiences and how they accepted Yeshua as their Savior and Mashiach. And I happened to watch Roth's testimony. Roth grew up going to synagogue like every pious Jewish family encouraged their young to do. He participated in the rituals. Read the Torah. It is bar mitzvah. And eventually reached of age and went off to college. And at that point, His connection, or what little he had with God, was broken. Just like a broken hyperlink. There was a void in Ross's life, and he started to seek out ways to fill it. He went down the path of spiritual gurus who were experimenting in some sort of hypnotic methods where they could train their brain to to see ahead, uh, predict future things. Roth got caught up in this movement and jumped around from these different spiritual directors. Meanwhile, he grew distant from his family and ended up leaving his wife and children. He became so obsessed with this It drove him deeper and deeper into depression. Later on, he is convinced that a demon had kind of taken him over. Just so happened, a Christian businessman handed him a Bible. Shortly after that, Roth bottomed out. And he said something in his testimony that really stuck with me, he said, when you're bobbing up and down in the middle of the ocean, you don't care who throws the rope to you. So he's at that point of desperation. And he says a two-word prayer. Jesus, help. The next day, He woke up, 
he was immediately transformed. No longer tormented or spurned to find out these shortcuts in life. He felt a sense of peace. He picked up that Bible that was given to him and began to read. And his growth transformed his life so much that his entire Orthodox Jewish family came to know Jesus as their Savior. From two words, Jesus help. The word that's used in, in this, this adoption, withesia is the word in Greek, and it means full inheritance and rights that you get. When you are adopted, like Paul said, when you call out, Abba, Father, what does that mean? And you submit your life to this Lord, you receive blessings. And I'm going to share with you four blessings of the adoption into spiritual sonship. The first one is the love of the Father. The prophet Zephaniah in the Old Testament was kind of a doomsdayer. He prophesied about the enemies of Israel they're going to be delivered justice and the nation of Israel for their sin. But near the end of his prophesying, you find in chapter 3, verse 17, a very powerful verse. It goes like this. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take delight in you. In His love. I hear a lot about the Old Testament portrayal of God. Isn't it two gods? That one in the Old Testament, it, He's just vengeful and justice and wiped them out. And, it, and then and you get in the New Testament, it's all lovey-dovey. This can't be the same God. That's what I say to that. Right there in the text, it says, in His love. The word in Hebrew is ahaba. A-H-A-B-A -A -A is the English rendering of it. Isn't that very similar to the Aramaic for father, Abba? There's no coincidence there. The text says, in His love, He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. <clears throat> to me, this speaks of restoration. In His love, He restores you. Brother Lawrence once said, prayer is like having a secret conversation with the soul of God. Oh man, that is good. A secret conversation. When you were little, someone would tell you, can I tell you a secret? And you would immediately kind of, what? And I think about that. God wants the secrets in our heart. He seeks that. That you can come to tell Him any secret you want. The second blessing is the Father's identity. We go to Galatians and Paul writes in verse in chapter 3 verse 26. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized in Christ have clothed Clothe yourself with Christ. I love that last part. Clothe yourself with Christ. We talk about putting on, Paul talks in Ephesians about putting on the armor of God when you're under attack. But you clothe yourself with Christ. 
And you do that through prayer. When you walk out the day to begin a Monday work week, do you clothe yourself in Christ to prepare you for that? Oscar Thompson, the author of a wonderful book called Concentric Circles of Concern, wrote, when you pray, you enter the throne room of heaven where the decisions that govern the universe are made. You get access to the throne room where it all happens. The behind the scenes look when it's all put together. That's what prayer is. The third blessing comes to us in Exodus chapter 34. Let me just kind of frame the context for you. This is where Moses had received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And he bring, brings down the, the, set, the very finger of God and carved on these tablets. When he comes down from Mount Sinai, the kingdom of Israel had in, been embroiled in idolatry with the golden calf. And you think about what God had gone through. He had taken these people out of Egypt and through a series of the plagues and miracles, He had delivered them. All along the way, they complained. He took them through the desert and miraculously provided manna for them and water from the rock. He leads them to this mountain out in safety. And their leader goes up, comes back down, and then they do this. Moses, in his anger, breaks the Ten Commandments. Slams them down. Gives them a body slam. Wow! Breaks them. He's got to go back up and get another set. When he goes up to get another set, you would expect God to be like, I'm going to lay the smack down on those Israelites. I've had enough of them. That's not what you see in the text. In verse 6 of chapter 34 in Exodus, it says, And he, that's God, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. It's right there. You would expect God to be angry. That's not what He gets. He get, here's another set. Take it down to Him. I was reading an article for one of my classes I'm taking. It was written by a Bob Eklund, and Bob Eklund is based out of Washington, the state of Washington. He does a lot of work with prisons, and he does a lot of work in the missions field. So he learns, he's really good about how to take the gospel and give it to people who are not from the conventional way of, of, of maybe they're from brokenness, or maybe there's a language barrier, or what have you. So he goes into this, this prison in the state of Washington, in the first meeting, he asked, where are you hurting? And the eight to ten inmates there said various things. They were all physical things. Well, my back is really messed up. My knee is really messed up. I don't hear too well out of this ear. So Eklund gathered them around, he laid hands on, and he prayed for their ailments, for healing Prayed for him every day. He came back near the end of the week and the inmates came in for their gathering. And there was a buzz about the room. Yeah, my knee doesn't bother anymore. My back doesn't bother anymore. I can hear now. This is wonderful. Jesus is healing you. This goes on for another week or two, and then 
Eklund gathers them around one time and, and he said, okay, where do you hurt? All of the inmates in the group took their hand and went like this. Put their heart. And he prayed over them. And he prayed a prayer of forgiveness. And he starts off, Our Father. A Spanish nun, Teresa of Avila, in the 16th century said, A prayer is like a garden. If it's cultivated with sunlight and water, it becomes lush. Under neglect, it shrivels and dies. So if that were, tr that were true, and if you, your prayer life is like a garden, what's it look like? Is it lush? Is it one that people admire? Is it flaunted out front? Or is it nestled in the back? Blossoming. Are there weeds growing up in it where you can't even see the flowers? Or is it just rocks? Not really a garden at all. The final blessing is the Father's authority. And we find this in the Great Commission where Jesus gathers His disciples before His ascension and gives them some instructions. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. This authority I give to you to share with them. And prayer is not just our human efforts of reaching out to God. It is also God's way of extending His hands to ours. I love that visual. Extending His hand to ours. You know, in Ephesians, Paul says, that we need to get our roots into the love of God. Our root system. That garden that we're talking about. You know, when Berners-Lee created the HTML, and you click on a hyperlink, and that link takes you directly to another page. It, it's, it's still fascinating. I mean, you click on a little link, and, and a video will pop up. A picture will pop up. Soundbite, a game will play, a movie will play. You can connect with someone across the, the planet. Just a little click. If you think about God, how many broken hyperlinks does He have in front of Him? How frustrating is it when you, get, you click on a link and it doesn't do anything? Why won't this work? Call, I'll email the IT desk. That's what we do. Well, the hyperlink doesn't work. Does your hyperlink work? Are you linked up? What's your prayer life like? I was thinking when I was preparing this sermon, I was thinking about what, what if you, you had every, a, a journal with uh, you know, 365 days in it? I guess the quarter sheet there would be there too, if I'm scientifically accurate there. And every page was, your prayer life was written down. Like your connection to God. Just think about that for a moment. You've got this, this, this notebook. What would it say? Would, would there be, how many blank pages would be in it? 
How many pages might say, Lord, please help the Miami Dolphins win today. <laughs> I used the Bengals in the other, but I got to give props for, for Tyler to sticking with the Miami Dolphins for three and 20 years. <laughs> but if you think about it, what would it, what would your prayer journal read? Would it just be a laundry list of things? Help this person, heal this person, this, this, that. There's nothing wrong with that. But would it have messages to your father? Dad, I need help. Dad, did you see this? Dad, what do you think about this? Dad, I'm scared. Dad, what should I do in this situation? Dad, thank you for this. Dad, you're awesome. You know, I, I was coming home from school on Friday. It had been a tough week. I was kind of down. And it, it was, it's been kind of gloomy, hadn't it? I mean, we've got a little bit of sunshine, but it's, lately it's been, someone said we've had like three sunny days in the last... So many months. It wasn't a sunny day. And I'm driving home, and I ha happen to look off to the, it would have been the west, and there's thick clouds. But there's this one little pocket that kind of goes, whoosh, and it opens up. And then a ray of sunshine just blasts through it like a spotlight on a dark sky just boom right through it and I'm like well, that's I'm fumbling for my phone I'm trying not to hit parked cars trying to get a picture of this and I see this amazing sign son I'm here no matter how dark you think it is, I'm here. Here's some light for you. Wow. And right there, I said, God, Father, that was awesome. I didn't get into a prayer full of grandiose words and poetic performance. I didn't quote Scripture. I just said, God, Father, that's awesome. Thank you. It's as simple as that. He just wants that relationship. The proximity has changed. His disciples, when they were sitting listening to Him talk on the Sermon on the Mount, their view of God was way out here. He's distant. And Jesus says, no, Abba, here, here, I'm ready, I'm ready for that relationship. And it's this, this simple prayer, I'm going to use things you already know, but the key is the proximity, I'm here in the flesh. Because this sin is a big problem. It is a big problem. And I've tried to fix it. I've tried other ways to fix it. I've tried using the nation of Israel. I've, I've tried sending prophets. I've tried all these things. And you know what? I know I have to fix it myself. So the Father comes to us. And that's the kind of Father I want in charge of my life. The one that comes right here to us. That opens his heart. And all, that, all he had to say, were those, remember, the, remember the two words that, that uh, Sid Roth said? Jesus, help. Help. An SOS to God. It wasn't some long, drawn out, ordeal he just said Jesus help
But we want to make it so much more. You know, I, I'll finish with this. When I was growing up, I grew up in the church, and we had to learn the Lord's Prayer. I don't remember at what age. I was pretty little, and they gave us this little, like, we made this uh, cut-and-paste flip chart. You know, we get in our little cut our little pieces of the Lord's Prayer out, and we'd have this little flip thing. I remember it was orange. I don't know why that stuck with me, but it was orange, and I pasted it. Of course, it was crooked because I did, wasn't real handy with the scissors. And I would practice parts of the Lord's Prayer to where I could get it and I could recite it for my Sunday school teacher without messing up. That was the goal. You got a little sticker and eh, you know, people would cheer you. And it, was, it was really cool if you could do that. So I, I worked at it and I worked at it and I worked at it. And I finally got it. I remember I was so excited. I did it in front of my, my mom, heard it. And I said, you know, I rubbed it into my sister. Hey, I got it before you, you know, kind of thing like that. And I did it in front of the class. And I came home. And you know what I did with the little flip chart? I put it in a drawer. And there it stayed. And then I got a broken hyperlink. And I really didn't. My garden just kind of dried up. Wasn't much to it anymore. Had weeds growing up in it. And you really couldn't even tell it was a garden at one time. When I came here, and I wanted to get involved, I wanted to cultivate a garden, and I, and I, and I met a man named Keith Levy, and we decided, hey, you helped me teach this class called Discovering Christian Life. You could put that up on the screen, and it was a game changer for me. This class... You have the opportunity to be part of it. But this was where my garden started to get lush. When I learned what I had been missing, that drawer that I had closed opened back up. And I realized what I was missing out on. A father who so desperately wanted just a relationship with me, to listen to me. I missed out on that. You haven't taken that class. There's four books to it. It's intense. If if your prayer life is is a rocky garden, this will help. Another class we got coming up, Anton's teaching, and and I've done this one with our with our men's group in the in the Saturday morning Bible study. We went It was titled, Simon to Peter. And he designed this Bible study to show a transformation of how Simon starts off and when he becomes Peter. And he delivers in Acts, he delivers this amazing speech and sermon and prayer that 5,000 people give their lives to Jesus right there. He was... A fisherman. And you're going to go catch men. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. There's opportunities to fix those broken hyperlinks. It may be a class for you. It may be just diving into the Word. It may be just getting down on your knees and saying, Jesus, help, like Sid Roth. But ultimately, it's up to you. You can do like I did. You can learn that Lord's Prayer and shut that drawer. You can have a a prayer life where it's like, you know, you pray for your favorite NFL team to win or you pray for some relative that has cancer. You you pray for, hey, I want to win the lottery. You know, you, you do for all those things like that. You can have a prayer life like that. Or... You can call out to your father like those prison inmates did. And he's going to show up at the right time and in the right way for you. Let's pray. Abba, 
our Lord, our Father. Lord, may this message penetrate into the hearts of those who hear it. In a simplistic way, Jesus, help. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, what do I do here? It doesn't have to be fancy. But you have a Father who loves you so much that He changed the proximity and He changed the course of history. He's right here in front of us waiting, waiting, Almighty God, for those broken links to be repaired so we could communicate on a regular basis and we could enjoy being adopted into the kingdom of God and all its love and forgiveness and have an identity in Christ and the authority that this spills out, the love just spills out of us and other people want to know, what do you have? Because I want it too. Abba, Father, hallowed be thy name. And the name is Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.